Joy everyone, greetings from Asian Productivity Organization. Hope everyone is staying safe and healthy during this pandemic. I am Asi Tambi Manikam from Policy and Analysis Division. And thanks to our viewers for joining us on this APU Productivity Talk series. And today we will discuss about uh, millennials and productivity. Currently, we work with the different generation people in our workplace, including millennials and generation Z. People over 45 with university degree were thought a modern worldview, and people under 35 with a university degree were thought a postmodern worldview, and therefore it must be managed differently. To share more insights with us about millennials and productivity, I am honored to welcome our chief guest speaker, Dr. Carl James Moore, Associate Professor from McGill University, Canada. How are you, Dr. Carl? Fine, very well, thank you. Uh, it's warm here in Montreal. Thank you. Uh, before I invite Dr. Carl to start his presentation, we would like to encourage our viewers to send your questions and comments to Dr. Carl with your name and country, and we would respond to your questions. Dr. Carl, now the floor is yours. Thank you very much and appreciate your introduction this morning and the chance to speak to people across Asia that are doing important things from what I've read about your group and from the connection I've had with them. What I'd like to talk about is my latest book. And this is the title of the book is OK Boomer. And that's a mem that was uh, going around about a year, year and a half ago, which was talking about the fact is that boomers like to make fun of younger people. And the boomers and the Generation X, the older ones, are the people in charge. But they like to make fun of younger people. But what I argued is that a lot of what younger people want, Generation Zs and millennials is what we want as boomers and Xers within a year or two. So we should be reverse mentored by young people rather than making fun of them. And this is a picture of a trip from Asia. I took a bunch of students a couple of years ago to uh, Malaysia. And this is a picture of the students I, over in Malaysia. And we've done six trips to Asia because it's such an important part of the world and becoming even more important. So as a good re a professor, I've got a considerable number of research interviews to back up what I'm saying. So it's partly philosophical. We'll get into that in a few minutes, but it's based on a lot of conversations. Over 700 with C-suite executives. Now, C-suite rather executives are executives C in their titles. So CEO, COO, CMO, CFO, and so on. They're among the most senior leaders in any organization. So I read hundreds of them, a few of the names like Justin Trudeau or Sir Richard Branson, you'd probably recognize. Then there's a lot of executives from Canada, the US, Europe. I teach at Oxford. I was there on the faculty for a number of years and still teach over there from time to time. And then my university, McGill in Montreal, has a MBA in Tokyo. So I've done quite a few interviews in Tokyo. And on our trips, we've been with students to Malaysia, Indonesia, the Philippines, um, Japan and Thailand, so did interviews there as well. So it's not entirely global, it overlooks Latin America and, and Africa to a large degree, but again, it's a fairly global sample. Then I've interviewed hundreds of students here at McGill and other places to understand their view of the world and some of the issues they wrestle with. So that's the research base. This is an important issue because what we see is a graying of the developing world and the developed world. Now, the developed world is not a surprise. You think uh, in much of Europe, you think Italy and Portugal and so on, the number of children per woman is 1.2, 1.3, considerably below 2.1, which is what is required uh, to replace people in the current generation, let alone grow. So we see that there's an aging of Europe particularly. We see some of that aging occurring in the US, Canada, Australia, but we're somewhat redeemed by immigration. It puts pressure on our society to accept people different than ourselves as Canadians or Americans or Australians. That's something our societies occasionally wrestle with. But in Canada, it's been a long tradition. My uh, grandparents moved here from Finland, Ireland on the other side. And it's a long tradition, though, the countries where the people are coming from are more and more in Asia. So again, some tensions, but we're hopefully making our way through that. But even the developing world, there's a shortage of young people coming. This means that focusing on the Zs and the millennials is particularly important. 
Now, we see that in China with the one child policy meant that there's fewer young Chinese. And so it's a bit more of a pyramid like this, where you have quite a few older people, often four grandparents for one grandchild, where there's few down here. Now with in China, with couples being allowed to have more children, that is becoming less of an issue for young people, for children, but for adults, there's quite a, uh, a missing set of people there because of the one child policy. This is showing uh, the Canadian population, male and female, blue and red, from the 1970s to the early 2000s. So this is my generation. You can see the baby boomers is that bulge there in the middle and having fewer children. So it's something where it starts off as a pyramid, and then the pyramid, as you can see, goes up. What that says, and this is very similar to the U.S., the U.K., and much of Europe, but perhaps even more intense in continental Europe, is that there's this bulge of boomers, but there's a lack of young people coming along. And that's what we're wrestling with and thinking about quite a bit. So is this anything new at all? And the answer is, well, no, we've always had generations. Uh, Self-evidently, we, we have that for the world to continue. But what is different about this is that we have three to four generations together. And this has really not happened before, perhaps our parents' generation somewhat, but for the vast majority of human history, you simply weren't around. People didn't exist. I'll show you a slide in that in a minute. So what is new is that we have three or four generations working together. Where in the past was a pyramid where when I worked at IBM years ago, people in the 20s were at the bottom. People in the 30s were here, 40s and 50s, and then the 50s and 60s ran the place. So partly how you got up into the hierarchy and got into more important leadership positions was by simply aging, which is connected with getting experience. What we see today is quite interesting and different that you have um, high potentials which are anointed uh, in their 20s and they are taken up into the hierarchy higher up than their age would indicate. So it turns that age thing on its, on, on its uh, edge. Plus we also have that people in their 50s and 60s may pull back a bit and give up their senior roles and become a senior engineer or a senior IT person, bringing their wisdom and knowledge, but not working the long hours required at the top. So in the past, age meant you ran things, where today that's not quite as true, particularly in the West. But I think parts of China are catching up with this as well. This is from Wikipedia, and it shows kind of the ages typically of most of human history. And we see that people over 50 would no lot be, not be around because of the average age was much lower than that. And so it's only in the last two generations that we see people working in their 60s and 70s. It was, uh, you, you can recall that 65 is kind of often seen as a traditional age for retirement. This was based on Germany during Bismarck's time where there's very few people over 65. So that it was a nice pension, but very few actually got to the age where they could enjoy having the pension. Where today what we see in North America and Europe is that people are doing early retirement or some people are continuing to work longer than they have in the past. So one expression is 60 is the new 40. So that if you're in good health and you have your mind with you there, that you can continue to work longer than in the past. But again, this is a modern phenomena that you can see here from the age. This had not happened in the past. This is an interesting idea. And what we got from the Roman, idea, uh, Roman Empire, Roman army of cohorts and saying that in the Roman Empire, that they had the Roman army, which was a powerful mechanism, that the men would stay in the army for 20 years. And then Rome would retire them, give them land across the empire, which meant they had spies that were very loyal to Rome all over the, the empire. So it's the idea that the men you were with and spent 20 years fighting with and moving around the empire with, you came very close to it and you became like them. So it's the idea of a cohort. And we see that your the events you go through, in their, in their case it was war, the events that we go through influence us and in how we view the world. So you, my parents grew up in the Depression. My dad is a 16-year-old road the train on top illegally for several days from central Canada, Saskatchewan to Toronto. When he got there, it was tough times. 
uh, during the Depression. He got a job and he stayed with the same organization for about 40 years other than going to World War II. So to him, job security was very important. So when I quit IBM, which meant back then uh, a job for life, to go to Hitachi as they doubled my salary, he said, nonsense. You're giving up security, which IBM offered at the time, particularly. But for a depression person, security matters. So the events you go through impact you. Certainly COVID-19 has an impact on all of us. Now, if you're older like myself, you can kind of put it in context. You can remember SARS was in Toronto and in Hong Kong, and you kind of have a sense of, well, I've seen other things in the world a bit like this in my lifetime, where if you're 21, 22, 23, the Generation Z age, you don't. You don't have that kind of life experience to put it in perspective. So it may well have a, a bigger impact. So when I graduated with my MBA, there was jobs for everyone. I had multiple job offers, not because I was that great, but because it was just a hot economy. If you graduate during tough times, you have more of a negative view. So the boomers have more of a positive view of the economy because they've graduated and have lived in great times. But people graduating today, it's probably pretty good times actually in terms of looking for new employees and so on. But those, those world events impact you as a generation, as a group, as a cohort. And when we think about this, part of this is that people are just young and young people act differently than old people. But what I'm arguing, it's not just age difference of just young people versus older people, but it's generational because of the worldview they have. And this is the central idea in my book, which is coming out all being well later this fall. It's that people over 45 who have a university degree were taught a modern worldview. People under 35 for, who went to university were taught a postmodern worldview. So I say to executives, mea culpa, I've screwed up your workforce myself and all the other professors that teach young people. We're teaching them a different worldview than what their parents were taught. And I, I add a university education because people who didn't finish university, didn't go to college or university, are not taught this as strongly, but it's part of what we discuss in the media, what you see from Hollywood, from Bollywood. It's something that's out there in the ether, but it's particularly taught in universities. So worldview is something you tend to get in your late high school to 23, 24, 25. You're taught in later high school, but particularly at university, how you view the world. And we'll talk about things like hierarchy. What is the nature of truth? Who has truth? Who can teach who? These are some of the critical questions that come with a worldview. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. So to the next slide, please, I'll talk about the modern worldview. This is the worldview that was taught by, or to rather, the boomers. And it's a worldview that made sense in its day, and it was a reaction to what had come before it. So what we see is that it's mainly people over 40, as I mentioned. Um, we had a touching faith in science. Now, we look what our grandparents lived, in our case, in Northern Ontario, Saskatchewan, in um, homes that were one or two bedroom that didn't have running water, didn't have toilets, that our grandparents were here, then our, my brother and I did better. We see an increasing, everything was getting better. We could know truth thanks to science, and we could know what was going on. So this is the worldview that we were taught. One part of it was, famous cover of Time Magazine 1967, Is God Dead? And there was a repost uh, a few years ago by a couple of friends of mine, John Micklethwaite, who was the editor-in-chief of The Economist, now the editor-in-chief of Bloomberg, and Adrian Woolrich, who's the political editor of The Economist, God is back. Now, uh, Adrian's a good uh, atheist, uh, John's a good Catholic, but regardless of your personal beliefs, what we see is that in the 70s, we were taught that you know Christianity would flatline and Islam would flatline, but we, what we've seen is around the world, the growth in Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, and so on around the world, so that the idea of God is back. So what it is, is you have a worldview you were taught, but in the case of the modern worldview, it fell short. Now, the worldview, part of the modern worldview is to reject everything that came before it as inferior, whether it be in art or architecture 
or in music as something that was lesser because we were the pinnacle of human evolution. So the modern worldview rejected what came before it. Now the postmodern world, postmodern or after modern, recognized that the modern worldview had failed. The things that I was taught, that my generation was taught, fell short. So we see some of the interesting aspects of the postmodern worldview. And so the world, postmodern worldview is a reaction to some of the mistakes of the modern worldview. So we see that there's less truth with a capital T. So still truth of T, a capital T, but it's much less. So it used to be this much, now it's this much. So what, what is truth and who has truth is more of a question concept. We see a decline in hierarchy. So that there used to be that much difference in the top and bottom. Let me give you an example from medicine that might resonate with you. When I was young, we'd go see a doctor, be a man back then, he'd have a white coat on, a stethoscope around his neck, and he'd be sitting behind a desk you could land an aircraft carrier on that was so big. He was God, we were here, and when he gave us a prescription, my mom would get it filled, I would take it. Where today what we see is a decline where it's much less of this huge hierarchy, but much less when it comes to medicine. So these days, when I go see the, the doctor, I would Google what's wrong with me and come up with two or three explanations, which I would share with the doctor. So I come prepared with some knowledge and I still accept that he's the doctor, she's the doctor, but there's less hierarchy in medicine. We used to call some medical things that came from Asia, we call the doctors quacks. Now at McGill Medical School, we have a department of complementary medicine that we see it as perhaps not as good as Western medicine, but it's complementary and it adds where we used to call them quacks or frauds in the past. So it's a very different sort of thing. Can we go back to the slide before, please? Thanks. A couple other points here. We've gone from individual to collaboration. Our groups of the undergrads and MBAs at McGill work in groups all the time. We believe we're preparing from the real world, but rather than the individual, it's now about how we work together on teams. I mean, literally it's Microsoft Teams, but it's a team approach rather the individual. There's a sense of things beyond science and analysis, what we call emotions. So when I backed, when I worked at IBM, if anybody got emotional in a meeting, we'd stop the meeting and have a coffee whenever emotion reared its ugly head. Where in the past, science was here and emotion was, sorry, lower down here. Where today we see uh, emotion and science analysis on a more even plane, that our emotions matter, that they are really important. And finally, looking for purpose. We'll talk about this a little bit more. And this is all amplified by technology, particularly social media. And if I, we were in group work, I'd ask you to discuss which of that resonates with you. As a younger crowd, I suggest it does, all of it pretty much. But I want to talk to executives. To some degree, they're puzzled by it. On the other hand, they recognize it as part of the world they live in. So I'm going to go through six principles about how to work more effectively with millennials or Zs. Taking a drink of water here, it's um, pretty warm in Montreal. So the first is the privileging of all voices from the age of deference to authority and age to an age of reference. In simple terms, my story is as good as your story. It's what young people believe. Because what we look at is the nature of truth, who has truth, who has knowledge, has evolved from the modern to the postmodern, what we see is that it used to be this huge hierarchy is much less, even in terms of who has truth and knowledge. And this is actually important from a viewpoint of how we do strategy, which we'll get to in a minute. It, to net it out, we say, listen more, talk less, is the advice to older people. Where in the past, as the older person with authority, I'd say, here's what we're doing. Ironically, that's what I'm doing today because of the nature of the, of the medium we're using. But instead of talking, I've got to more listen. And in fact, I'm doing a book on introverts, ambiverts, and extroverts. And what I'm arguing is that the extroverts out there like myself have got to act more like an introvert and listen more than they have in the past. So we have the privileging of all voices here where they believe their story is almost as good as my story. That's not true to some degree, that my experience and knowledge and wisdom and gain through decades of work 
is valuable. And we can undervalue that sometimes as young people, but it has declined relatively. This is uh, perhaps more of a challenge in parts of Asia where parts of culture say that older people are the ones you listen to. And you should, but what I'm arguing to older people is that how we develop strategy has evolved in the postmodern world. So there's two big schools of strategy. One is Henry Mintzberg here at McGill, and the other one is Michael Porter at Harvard. So I, I took classes with Michael a long time ago at Harvard, and we gave him an honorary doctorate a couple of years ago at McGill, and I spent an hour interviewing him for our national newspaper, The Globe and Mail. It was interesting because they're still relevant. When I interview CEOs, we see that they're still relevant. Michael's more deliberate approach. So the deliberate approach is that the CEO with one or two of his top people, perhaps from McKinsey, Bain, or BCG, sits down and comes up with the plan and sends it down the pyramid. And we salute and go, yes, ma'am, that's why you're the boss, love your ideas. Where in a world which isn't changing much, that approach worked. And for example, I talked to the CEO of Air France, Ben Smith, and Ben pointed out that for big strategic decisions like what kind of plane are we going to have in the fleet, he makes that decision with some advice and he takes it to the board because it's billions of dollars. And if we get it wrong, Air France is in trouble and Ben Career is in trouble as well. So sometimes it makes sense to be from the top down. But the emergent approach, which Mintzberg has talked about and written about for a few years now, is more of today's world. So the emergent approach says that ideas come from the frontline troops dealing in a turbulent environment, a turbulent world create ideas, and their ideas bubble up. Now, what it is, the role of senior management is still important. Senior managers decide which ideas which bubble up are ones that get resources, that grow and are spread across organization to create new strategies. So it's emerging from boundary spanners. That is people have one foot in the organization and one foot in the turbulent environment of the world. So they're closer to the real world than the senior executives who often have four or five levels of, of filters between them and truth. Now, a good CEO knows that and tries to have meeting with Generation Zs to find out what's going on and tries to talk to customers. But there's something about the people that are out there talking to real life customers or suppliers, et cetera, that understand the turbulent world that we live in. In a turbulent world, if that's true of your world, and I'm hard pressed to think of an industry it's not, perhaps government at times, you need, you need to be fleeter foot, more agile, and create new strategies more rapidly. In that case, it emerges from lower in the hierarchy. So it turns the hierarchy on its head because of the nature of how we do strategy in today's world. Part of what we've moved from this age of deference to authority and to the senior people in age of reference is there's so many more sources of knowledge out there. When I worked at IBM a long time ago, I would keep knowledge close to my chest because it gave me power. Where in a world of Google, you can't do that anymore. Knowledge is out there. And I have students, undergrads who Google when I say something and we'll put their hands up and say, uh, Carl, that was 1987, 198, not 1986. And they go, good point but it probably doesn't really matter. And they agree it's no big deal. But we have so many sources of reference and knowledge. In the old days, you used to ask people for directions how to get their home. I remember when I lived in England, it generally included a pub or a tree that burnt down. Local knowledge I just didn't have. And sometimes I would stop at a pub and go in and say, how oh, I'm Canadian, I'm lost. How do I get to this village? And generally, two men in a, in a pub in England would give you differing directions of how to get there. But in today's world of Google Maps, just what's the address? And I'll put in Google Maps, and I don't even want your instructions because of fluidity of traffic conditions means that I may go a different direction. I drove from Quebec City, but a three-hour drive from Montreal yesterday, back and forth, see some family with my wife who's from there. And again, it sent me on different routes based on live data. Now, an accident might happen a minute or two in front of me, which changed things. But by and large, I trust that information. This is a shift of knowledge and of truth, who has it and where it is. Oh, one other point I want to get into uh, before we get that is about active listening. So part of what you have to do is talk less, listen more. You've got to be an active listener. And this is from the Harvard Business Review, 
Christine Warden from the University of Kentucky, talks about three principles to be a better listener and talks about recognize the, the full range of verbal and nonverbal cues. So you not only listen to the words, you watch the person gestures, the tone, their facial expressions. And this is what's part of tough on Zoom. You only get from kind of here up sort of thing. You don't see the person squirming. It's harder to see the facial expressions because of the size of your screen off and you might be looking at your, your iPhone or something and it's just hard to see where in, in a meeting with the person in, in the flesh, it's gonna be much easier to do. Then you process and give back and summarize to show the person you were listening and show that you understood them. And then what you do is respond. So this is again, three-step model that uh, Christine is coming up, which I think is very helpful. So a bit there in active listening, some you could do some more research to find out more about it. Okay, so we've talked about the first point. The second point is feedback. And feedback, why and how, let's get to the next slide. First is the need for feedback. So what we see is that Generation Z and younger millennials grew up playing video games. Our son plays video games. Um, I try to beat him with no success, but video games give you enormous amount of feedback as you go through it. Also social media. Many of us, uh, and I do this sometimes, if I have a new LinkedIn post or something, I'll get up and one of the first things I do is say, how many likes did I get? How many views did I get? You know, and sometimes on LinkedIn, I'll get 20, 30,000, and that's exciting to think that you've reached thousands of people, but we get feedback all the time. We also have helicopter parents in the US and Canada where um, they spend a lot of time with their kids. They're talking, my wife's a grade three teacher, they're talking to the teacher in a way that the boomers, parents didn't worry about. The teachers had authority, they did their job and they did it well and you didn't bug them about it. And again, in US schools particularly, there's enormous amount of feedback that was not given to the boomers or to the senior generations. What is interesting is when I give feedback to students and Sometimes they ask for so much, I go, that's it, I'm all done, I've ran out of feedback. But I spend more time as a manager, as a professor as well in the, in the classroom, when students present, thinking about what feedback can I give them as they really are looking for that feedback. The interesting thing is they're willing to disagree with my feedback. And that's probably because I'm giving them a lot more feedback, five or six points rather than one or two. So the fifth or sixth point is maybe a little bit more iffy but they're less impressed with hierarchy and that I don't have truth of the capital T, but I do have experience, I have valuable things, I'm the boss, that's always, uh, you know, kind of clarifies things, but they're willing to disagree with my feedback, which is just amazing in a way to me. Now there's three types of uh, feedback, and this is kind of a practical thing for managers or what you're looking for from your manager, if you're a younger person. So one is uh, appreciation, and we'll talk about that for a minute. There's coaching, which is feedback, kind of coaching as a, co a coach would in a sport, whether it be football, uh, soccer to most of the world, where the coach would say, you should do this, you should do that, be more effective. And we like to have coaching to help us how to improve our presentations, how to improve what we do on a Zoom call, for example. The third is evaluation, where we're ranked at, in the past, it's been the end of the year, the annual review. Um, a lot of companies, the value have moved to much more regular feedback because the annual review was something that both sides of the table hated. So we see that feedback is more regular, very regular, and uh, I find Zs and millennials want feedback from me in a way they didn't in the past or their older generations didn't. So we've got to give more feedback and it's three types of feedback, appreciation, coaching, and evaluation. So let me talk about appreciation for a minute. So there's five types of appreciation you can show at work. This is a call called the five languages of appreciation. It came out of family theory, the five languages of love, but Paul White, one of the co-authors, turned into a book about appreciation at work. And this is something that Generation Zs really do appreciate, as well as older people as well. So one is words. So I'll just go briefly through these five. And the idea is a manager should be able to show all five types, but this is a certain but we'll get to in a minute. One is words. Great job, I appreciate how well your presentation went. So give words of appreciation. Other people say talk is cheap. Words, yeah, yeah, you just talk all the time. What I'd like is some quality time where you listen to me. 
So what they'd like to say is, I might say to Susan, let's go grab a coffee and give Susan 15 minutes of time where I'm listening to her and I say, Susan, how's things going at work? How can we improve? How can we do a better job? But I'm focusing my listening on her rather than me talking, I'm listening. Other people like acts of service. So my secretary, sometimes she gets overwhelmed, uh, probably because of the work I give her. So sometimes I'll say to her, Darlene, let me do that. I'll take it off her plate. I'm serving her, making her life easier to show her appreciation for her hard work and her success. Two more. One is small gifts. So when I travel, there's two accounts help me with uh, traveling with the students. We get them a small gift when we're over in uh, Tokyo uh, two years ago. Gave it to them a small ceremony to the accountants. And it wasn't the cost of the gift. The idea that we thought about them, we know their likes, so that we got them something we know they like. And while we're over in Tokyo enjoying uh, the pleasures of visiting one of the countries, in, one of the great countries in the world, we thought of them. So it shows appreciation. The final one, which is more iffy at work, is touch. And again, this is something which depends on culture to some degree. But I was up in Quebec City visiting family. And so uh, we all kissed each other on both cheeks because it's a Canadian, French Canadian thing to do. And so touch is something very iffy for men. But it's something where, you know, uh, women might hug each other or you might just tap someone on the shoulder. Job well done. So some cultures are more touchy. You can think of the Italians, the Greeks, Mediterraneans tend to be more that way, but it depends on your culture. We tend to like one of these. I like words of appreciation. That's what I want to get. But the problem is we give the one we tend to like. So I like words of appreciation, so I tend to give it. But if my secretary wants acts of service, that's what I should give to her. So what I need to do is understand my people what are the things they're looking for? How do they like to be appreciated? And then show them appreciation in the way that they prefer. So I have my preferred style with maybe a backup style, but I need to learn to speak all five, using touch carefully, of course, learn to speak all five. So when you think about it, when we give feedback, we've got to align what is my purpose in giving this feedback, go back to the three purposes we talked about. Is it the right purpose from my viewpoint, the conversation we're having? And then is it the right purpose from the other person's viewpoint? So are they looking for, what are they looking for in this feedback? Is it a coaching session? Is it appreciation? Is it evaluation? So we have to understand from both sides of the table, which one you're doing. So a couple of summary thoughts here on constructive feedback, be specific, don't be vague. Say when you showed that slide, it was too busy or the customer gave some feedback, but you didn't listen enough. So you specifically give it, uh, you talk about behavior that can be changed. If you say, Carl, you're bald, I go, it's true, but what can I do about it? So there's something where I can actually action and do something different. Um, be descriptive rather than evaluative. So it's, it's more neutral and just saying, this is my observation, I may be wrong. So there's a bit more humility um, and less kind of, you know, being really descriptive, uh, evaluative in terms of doing, and also explain kind of the consequences on the team, the other people, and on the organization. And this is why this is important. So the why is an important thing. And be the third point here of six. It's talking about emotions. In the past, we focused on analysis on the facts, but what we have to do is think about emotions today, because this is valued in postmodern thought. And Generation Z and millennials simply see emotions as a valid way to understand and view the world. I'm just going to show you a quick model here from a colleague, Kui uh, Wee, who's a professor at INSEAD over in the Fontainebleau. Actually, I think he's in Singapore now. He's teaching out of their Singapore campus. And it's saying is that where does strategic advantage come from? And it's often coming from more of the middle. In the blue, they're energized knowledge workers and middle management is where it's coming from. Rather than the top, kind of the porter model of deliberate top-down strategy, it's coming from our knowledge workers. And what it's saying is that when you look at our knowledge workers, we have low energy, high energy people, high focus, low focus, that the people with high energy and high focus, which are the ones where we want people to be, it may be more than 10%, they're purposeful. What we want to move, the disengaged, the procrastinators, or the overly distracted rather up to that purposeful. 
if we go from 10 to 20%, what a reaction that would be. So what you need to do is think about how do we get energy among our people and how do we give them focus? Now, focus is explaining what they should do. The energy is the emotion side. So please come up with the five levers of superior performance focusing on emotions. And I've done some work with him and taught this many times. It's a great idea. So saying there's five levers. So as a manager, as a leader, we've got to think about how do I manage the emotions, not the in emotional quotient EQ, which is what I have or you have, it's at a group level. So as a manager, I'm going to manage five emotions with my people in order to get them to be in that higher energy, high focus quadrant, particularly high energy part of it. So these are the five um, emotions that Kui has talked about from the literature. One is pride. So I want to manage the pride among my people because if I'm proud of my organization, proud of what I'm doing, I'm more apt to work harder. I'm more energy. I'm more going to work longer. I'm going to put myself into it, not that I feel abused, but because I have pride of what I'm doing and where I am. Oxford University, where I taught for years, great pride in being one of the great universities in the world, um, really made people work harder to be there. Another one is fun. So the idea is that we need to have fun at work in order to lead to innovation. So innovation is something we all need in virtually every organization. How you get that is by having fun and passionate work. So it's a time to loosen up because in that lies more creative ideas. So there's got to be laughter at time. There's got to be that sense of, of having some fun along the way. We have to have constructive discontent. And this is an idea we learned from Japan to a large degree about coming to work unhappy and willing to change things not necessarily huge changes, but change things and never be satisfied with the status quo that we always want to move forward. So we want that emotion of continuous improvement, of continuous discontent. We want hope. We're willing to sacrifice today if we have hope of a better future, that things will get brighter in the future. So we want to create hope. So the thing is for the manager to take specific actions to create hope for a better future. And being authentic, we'll get into in a minute. So the next point I want to talk about is the need for purpose among millennials and Generation Z. There's a famous bumper sticker. It's probably too small for you to see there, but it's replicated there. He who dies with the most toys wins. Is a my, When I say that, my students just look horrified at the boomers. But we measured ourselves by how much money we had, how nice a car we drove, and things like that. But what millennials are looking for are, is a sense of meaning at work and in life and purpose. So we want this renewed sense of purpose at work, and we need to bring that forward. So this is something uh, Don Pontefract, he's a friend of mine out in uh, British Columbia, came up with this in a book. Uh, and he talks about the sweet spot where what we want to do, and what I have to do is find this for myself, but also for my people. So I want to help them find that sweet spot where I'm good at it. The world needs it, so willing to pay me for it, and I find pleasure and joy in it. So that's what I'm looking for is finding something where it's kind of natural for me. I find I have a passion for it. It's relevant to the business, the organization I'm with, and they're willing to pay me for it, and we'll make the world a better place. So just the idea of just making money, driving up the share price is an old school idea that just doesn't resonate with young people. So move on to our fifth point is this idea of authentic leadership, being real. So millennials love authenticity. Now, boomers do as well, and the Xers, but it's a really strong value, this idea of authentic. You think about craft beers. You think about local vores, people that want food from the local area or cheese from their part of the country. This is something about authenticity, and they want authentic leaders, authentic people that ring true, that it's not kind of the the person in a suit who acts a certain way because they wear a suit and they wear a uniform, but it comes from the heart. So this is what millennials and Zs are looking for, particularly authentic leadership, where we show more of the self. And, you know, we might have a favorite baseball team or a football team, and we're more apt to show our personality, talk about our families a bit, let people know there's a human being in there, not just someone who's a cog in the wheel, but someone who is real and someone that I can feel a sense of human connection to. That's what I'm looking for. 
So our final point here of the sex is mentoring. Now, I have a couple of mentors in their 80s. It doesn't occur to them that they should ask my advice. But what we see is mentoring needs to be a two-way street. So young people have to reverse mentor older people. Older people and myself have to be reverse mentored. That is taught by young people. So I have undergraduates working for me six or seven on my radio show or for my classes and so on. And I ask them, how can I improve? Have I said something inappropriate? How can we get better? What are the technologies I should be looking for? What is the local, the latest social media, things like this that I shouldn't be involved with? So I think reverse mentoring is something that is a challenge for young people. The question is, how do you reverse mentor your manager, your boss in a respectful, polite way, but you've got to train them so they learn from your ideas? Because this is important from a strategic viewpoint and from a viewpoint of good, authentic leadership in today's world. So the last two slides, this is one, uh, and I'll show you in a minute, is uh, some of the work I publish. I blog for Forbes every week, and I publish a column for the Globe and Mail every two weeks on uh, Indigenous leadership. And that's the final slide. There's some articles of mine have been uh, published in, uh, or my research in The Economist uh, and other sources. So if you're looking for more of these ideas, these last two slides have some sources you could go to. So let me finish there. I see. Did you have some questions based on the presentation today? Yes. Uh, thank you very much for your wonderful and detailed presentation, Cole. And uh, I'm really very much impressed to know your forthcoming book later this year on how to effectively work with millennials. It was really an eye-opening session to know the challenges faced by millennials in the workplace and also the solutions for it. You also nicely explain the leadership qualities to manage the workforces of diverse age groups. And also you have touched upon very well about your findings on modern view and postmodern old view and six principles of working with the millennials. That was really an eye-opening session for us and also for viewers. I see and, you were um, really paying attention or you took good notes. I'm very impressed, I must say. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> and um, yes, I have a, a line of questions that I'd like to um, ask on behalf of uh, our viewers. Um, Nicole, actually, what is your advice to millennials on uh, generation Z uh, to manage upward more effectively? Well, it's interesting because in my long career, I've always had a boss, and I still do today, be the dean or the area coordinator. So something where you're going to have a boss and you have to manage upward. So when we think about managing, we often think of, we wouldn't say downward, but manage people that work for us. And that's an important part of management and leadership very clearly. We also have to manage our peers, the people that we are somewhat competing for, for resources and promotion and time. But the thing is, we've got to manage upward as well. This is just part of a career. And now you might say, I'm going to be an entrepreneur. But even entrepreneurs, from talking to many of them, entrepreneurs realize that if you want to be an entrepreneur but you don't have a boss, you're in trouble because you have your banker, you have your VC that's funding you, you have your spouse, you have your clients. So I'd argue that almost everybody has a boss. But clearly in the corporate world, that's true. You have someone you report to. So when we think about an important issue for Zs and millennials, because they're younger and more apt to have someone above them for sure, is that you got to think, of how do I manage upward? And there's some principles, I think, and there's some good articles written about this of how do you manage upward. Part of it is saying a central point is to understand what is the agenda of your manager? What is he or she trying to accomplish? Because they have things that are, so what happens is at the top, the CEO gives a strategy and then it goes to the vice presidents, goes down to the directors, goes down to the managers and goes down to the, where we are at the bottom of it, you know, we're close to the bottom, but it's something where the people at this level, their agenda fits in with the boss above them. And the director fits in with the vice president who fits in with the CEO. So at our level, we want to fit in and we want to understand and CEO wants to share their strategy with us so that our job fits in overall with the direction of the organization. One of the key things is to ask your manager, what is their agenda that year? What are the top three or four things they're working on? Because I'm more apt to be seen as valuable to them if I'm working on an issue which is important to them. 
that they are concerned about. And if I'm working on their number 17 thing, they don't care. But if I'm helping them with number two or number three or number one, I'm going to be valuable and useful to them. So a critical starting point is what is the boss trying to accomplish this year and how can I help them? Because it's going to mean that I'm a valuable, useful person to them. So that's, a, I think, a, a good, really good, important point to think about. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Carl. I, I think that was a very well uh, received. Uh, if you want to improve your productivity or to go up, definitely you need to have a boss to, uh, from strategic point of view, so that you will get keep improving, right? Well, it's absolutely, and your boss is going to give you promotions, is going to, you know, get maybe transfer you another part of the organization. So if your boss thinks you're valuable, you're more apt to have your career go well. And it's also good training that when you become that vice president, that you're going to align with the CEO strategy to make them look better. So it's something, just the principle of life. I think about, I'm meeting with our new dean in, in a couple of weeks. I want to understand what is she excited about? What does she want to accomplish? Because if I help her get to one of those goals, she'll think better of me and she'll more apt to reward me and help my career go well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cole. And now I'll move on to my next questions. So I understand that um, you are doing some uh, research on introverts, ambiverts, extroverts as leaders. How, how does it play out among the millennials and Zenders and Zs? Well, it's a huge topic. Uh, I uh, blogged. Uh, I blogged for Forbes. I've been doing it for about ten years. And about six, seven years ago, I wrote a book review with one of my undergrads of Susan Cain's book *Quiet*, which is a New York Times bestseller about introverts. And very, very huge response. Like we normally get a few thousand views. It was sixty thousand and counting. So we were just going. This topic resonates. So the next night, we had uh, my CEO class. We had two CEOs come that we do regularly. One was a guy named Claude Mangeau, who was the CEO of CN, railroad about 25,000 people headquartered here in Montreal. I never asked anyone before, but I said, Claude, are you more of an interviewer or an expert? And he said, I'm an introvert and went on in a quiet way for about 10 minutes. And, and so one of the things I'm, I'm saying to the world, and I've got a book I'm working on for Stanford uh, University Press, is that in the past, we viewed extroverts as leaders, where today we see a lot of leaders are introverts. And in fact, the title of my book is We're All Ambiverts Now. So an ambivert is someone, maybe a new word for some of our listeners, who acts like an invert at times and an extrovert at other times. What I'm arguing is that as a senior leader, and this is a skill set that Zs and millennials should start working on, is at times you need to act like an invert and be a good listener. So the extroverted person like me has got to learn to be quiet and shut up and listen, which was one of the points we had in the uh, other book as well. It's a needed skills to be a good listener. So CEOs tell me when they go to a room to discuss strategy, they know what they know already in their head. If they put their ideas out there, what it means is that it stops conversation. Because if the CEO has already expressed his or her view, everybody goes, oh, that's why your boss, Susan, I love your ideas. In fact, what a good CEO does is go, Jamie, what do you think? And Susan, what do you think? And Sam, what do you think? And goes around and learns from their subordinates, different perspective, different views. And in fact, the strategy at the end of it's going to be different than the one that came in in their mind at the beginning. Now, happy thought, I'm CEO, I get to say what the strategy is at the end. But the strategy evolved because I listened rather than the acting like the extroverted leader I am and put my thoughts out there. Now, on the other side, sometimes an introvert's got to act like an extrovert as a leader. And this is true at the more junior level. Sometimes you've got to work the room. You've got to go out there and introduce yourself to strangers because it's the right career move, whether it's to find a job or with an organization, you go introduce yourself to some senior person, have a good conversation with them, and they go away impressed with you. So I'm saying we all have to be ambiverts now. We've got to act like an introvert at time and an extrovert at time, another time but we recognize is that we have a hard wiring. And they did some research at the Harvard uh, University, the Department of Psychology, looking at four month old babies and the response to stimulation. So the central construct of introversion versus extroversion is how much 
stimulation do you like? Extroverts like lots of stimulation. So do introverts like some, but after a certain point, they tip over and take introvert breaks to recharge. I take extrovert breaks. So after writing a book, ironically about introverts, after a couple hours, I can't take it anymore. So I go downstairs, talk to undergraduates, one floor down and, and pump up my battery. I get stimulated by the conversation, by talking to people. So I take extrovert breaks. So what I'm saying is that we have to act like an ambivert, but it's unnatural for some, some of us like me, and I need to recharge my batteries. So I recognize what I am. And because it, the research at Harvard looking at four month old babies and as they evolve for decades, it was a pretty strong predictor at that age. So it seems to be part of our DNA to some degree. So I'm an extrovert, say la vie, it's the way I am. I need to act like an introvert, but I recognize it's exhausting and I take extrovert breaks to recharge. So it's something I would encourage Zs and millennials to learn from now to practice these skill sets because they'll need them as they make it to the C-suite. Thank you. Thank you, Cole. I think that was a very, very valid point that we have to, as an extrovert and also we, you need to go and learn from the babies like so that you will always have that kind of uh, like a mentality to grow up. And um, yeah, uh, because now we are in uh, like a COVID pandemic, so definitely I would like to have a, a word from your, your opinion about uh, how this uh, impact like a COVID crisis uh, have on like millennials or generation Z. So w w what do you feel like? What's your Something opinion on that? With long experience like me, I can remember, you know, for decades being in person and so on. If you're just starting your work experience, I have some students who are now starting as iBankers at Credit Splits and Goldman Sachs, and they're doing it on Zoom. They're doing it remotely. So part of the challenge is how do we enculturate Zs into the culture of our organization, or Goldman Sachs or Credit Suisse or whatever, is more of a challenge. From your viewpoint as a Z, how do I get enculturated? How do I learn how the act at Goldman and how successful Goldman people act? Is something you've got to learn in order to have your career go on to a better place. So it's a challenge from one side of the table, HR, the corporate head people, the headquarters people in New York, is how do we enculturate young people? From your viewpoint as a Generation Z, how do I become enculturated? So being, understanding and grasping the culture is an important thing. Uh, you can do that through conversations with mentors or so reading books about the company. Uh, talking to uh, older people about the history and who are the heroes here? Who are the ones we tell stories about? What are the uh, kind of thoughts of wisdom people share at Goldman or at Credit Suisse, or whatever, in terms of how we do things around here? A second part is how do you manage your boss and your relationships as you build your, your network in the organization? It's tough to do over Teams or Zoom. I think it's great from a corporate career viewpoint for Z's to be back in the organization if it's done safely because they can learn more about the culture and they can learn and develop relationships with managers, with peers, with senior executives. Because, you know, you bump into a senior executive in the elevator, just you and that person, you might ask them a good question. They go, oh, what's your name? And they know you as kind of a young star who had the confidence to in a, a respectful polite way talk to a senior executive and ask a good question have a good comment so it's those kind of skill sets that you want to develop are easier to develop in person but there's some good articles about how to do it on zoom and on teams and so on but i'm eager to uh, i'm in my office here at mcgill classes start next week i'm eager to be in the classroom students and develop relationships with them get to know them as human beings and hopefully mentor uh, them as well but that's part of what I think you got to think about. And if you can, in a healthy way, I would try to get back to work. Thank you. Thank you, Cole. I, I think it's a very valid point. And in fact, in Japan, like country, it's always like um, uh, you need to have a uh, like a relationship with the subordinates or co-workers. That actually plays a huge role in um, company's performance as well. Um, so that, that's a one point actually uh, in reality life I learned to when I was uh, working with the Japanese companies. I think that that's a very important point of which you said. Uh, very much agree on that. And uh, going to my next questions, actually, 
uh, what are the factors you consider to increase the productivity when um, different generations are employed actually it's a very general questions but i would like to hear your opinion when we think about productivity and that's the title of the session is how can we be more productive working with millennials and z's so it's kind of for senior management looking at younger people as well it's partly the challenge is to the millennials and the z's you know a big part of this audience is how do i manage upward how do i work effectively and by understanding the modern world view is a helpful starting place that we recognize that it's been replaced by the postmodern that some of our senior people our older people are still have some remnants of that thinking so it's helpful to understand their thinking because it will help you appreciate where they're coming from and know how to work with them and be able to present things in a way that makes sense to them so i think it's it's helpful to be you're more productive as a z if you understand older people and their world view and where they're coming from and essentially cut them a bit more slack you go if that was what i've been taught i would react the same way i'd be more hierarchical i would i would respond that way so i don't condemn them but i try to nudge them in a healthier direction that's going to be helpful in today's world rather than in yesterday's world and productivity i think also comes from senior people if there's anyone watching this from a senior level to really understand the z's and the millennials they are more of today's world they're more with it than we are typically we have things to teach them but i argue older people that 25% of the time you should be reverse mentored by young people so you can be more productive so you can be more of today's world so you can be a better leader a better strategist and in sport more, more inspiring manager but you know i make the point when i talk to uh, undergraduates i say what's the flip side of that and very few recognize that 75% of the time boomers and xers are mentoring z's and millennials so we've got to switch where it's 25% of the time or 20% of the time i'm being reverse mentored but the majority of the time my experience my education my years are something that i'm going to mentor young people with and it's a two way street thank you thank you professor kol and here my next question goes like from your research point of view so do you suggest like uh, millennials or generation z's might see work from home differently because now that's uh, most of us are working from home i just like to know what your research suggests on that point but well, some ways these and millennials are more uh, at home technology so working with technology from home is less of a challenge because this is a world that they've grown up with uh, they don't have decades like i do experience of the other where they don't miss that because they just don't have the experience to miss it in the same way and they love technology so in some ways they're better at it because they're digital natives so they just feel very comfortable with what's going on and how it's happening but i think there's a human frustration uh my undergraduates uh, particularly the first years like part of coming to university uh you know virtually everybody is single at that age and part of it was to flirt and you know have a bit of romance and also to have a girlfriend or boyfriend uh, you know someone who's just a good friend so they are missing those friendships and those relationships that they had in high school and they were anticipating from their older brothers and sisters said they would have so i think it's part of the hard hard wiring we have of human beings is to enjoy people's company to be in the room with them and it's something i think all of us are going to be really excited to get back to thank you thanks a lot for your explanations now the actually the time is up so let me ask the final questions um so could you please summarize the key uh, take away message for our viewers today well you see you know six ways of working more effectively with what i call postmoderns or generation z's and younger millennials what i just say is that you've got to learn as an older person what is their view of the world and given their view of the world what they want is perfectly sensible as a generation z or younger millennial say if you got to understand these points and go to your boss and explain it to them and say here's why our generation likes feedback we're so used to it therefore i'm looking for a lot more feedback in the past but it'll make me a better employee and make you look better because I'll, I'll work better so i think it's a matter of understanding some of those principles and learning explain them to senior managers in a way that's respectful but gets the message across 
Thank you. Thank you, Carl. And thanks a lot for your valuable insights. And I believe all of our viewers found your information and the insights very useful. Uh, I would request to post your questions in the comment section. And uh, we shall have respond those questions in the comment box when it is going on um, broadcasting in the YouTube channel. So APU Productivity Talk will be held every Tuesday and Thursday, featuring world leading experts from different sectors. So please subscribe this APO channel and stay tuned. Goodbye. Thanks a lot. Thank you.